Hey everybody, this is Michelle from Florida Keys Birding, and today we're going to talk about one of my favorite birds to find while I'm out birding, which is the roseate spoonbill. These birds are so pretty with their pink feathers, I just love finding them. I actually saw my first one last year in the Everglades, and every time I go, I really hope to see one, because you don't see them that often and you don't see too many of them. They can be mistaken for flamingo sometimes because of the pink color. I would love to see a flamingo too, but we're not going to get into flamingos today on this video. So let's go ahead and get into it and talk about their range. Their range includes coastal central to south Florida, coastal Louisiana and Texas, with breeding colonies in the Everglades, uh, Gulf Coast Tampa area, and near Cocoa Beach, Titusville, and of course on the coastline. They may stray farther inland during migration time. So some interesting facts about the roseate spoonbill. Um, a couple of things are the numbers declined in the early 1800s when they were being hunted for their plumage and they were being made into fans. That is just terrible. I'm so glad that there's laws nowadays that protect these birds and most other birds in general. So another cool fact is their pink color comes from eating crustaceans that they have um, fed on the algae in the shallows. So that's how they get their pink color, kind of like a flamingo. <laughs> and another fun fact is that a group of roseate spoonbills is known as a bowl of spoonbills. <laughs> that's kind of funny if you think about it, a bowl of spoonbills, hmm, interesting mental picture. <laughs> Anyways, uh, when spoonbills are foraging and they see a group of other spoonbills flying overhead, they actually stick their necks out and their bills straight up in the air, which is called sky gazing. Maybe they're just like, hey, there, look over there, there's Bob and his family, hey guys! <laughs> so maybe they're just like, you know, hey, what's up? So I think that's kind of cool that they do that. Um, you know, believe it or not, according to the Cornell Lab of Ornithology, they're actually low on the conservation concern list. I was surprised to hear this. I would have thought it would have been higher since you don't see them that much, but apparently they nest and hang out in areas where their numbers, um, you know, are, are higher, where there's not a lot of humans. So I guess this must be why they aren't being disturbed too much. So if there's not a lot of people around, to bother them, then I guess they're not being disturbed and I guess we're not seeing them because again they do this without lots of people around so um, you know that's uh, I thought that was an interesting fact as well. So let's talk a little bit about behavior. You'll usually find them walking slowly back and forth in the shallows with their spoon, you know, bill <laughs> in the water looking for prey. They are actually social and they flock together in groups of 2 to 400 when feeding and roosting. So as far as feeding goes, they like to feed and wade in shallow water, sweeping their bill back and forth. They have sensitive nerve endings um, in the bill and as soon as it feels some kind of a prey, it'll snap shut. So they'll forage in shallow waters for aquatic invertebrates like shrimp, prawns, aquatic insects, fish, and crustaceans. They do swallow the prey whole. So where do they live and hang out? You probably already guessed it. Water, coastal areas. But specifically, they like to hang out in areas with mangroves, saltwater lagoons, fresh and brackish water, bays and large shallow lakes and they nest and roost in trees and shrubs along the water's edge. So as far as breeding goes, they like to nest in colonies along with egrets and ibises, or ibis, I buy, I don't know, how do you say ibis plural? <laughs> if you know how to say ibis plural, comment below. Yeah, I don't know. So um, the information that I looked up, it said ibises, so I guess that's how it is. So that's right. Anyway, so they seem to like, um, they seem to manage to get along and all like each other, I guess, if they nest together and all of that. So that's a good thing that they don't bother each other. 
Um, I observed this last spring myself in the Everglades at Paradis Pond. Um, that's a place where you can find them probably in February, March time of year. That's when I went and that's when the park ranger said that they would be there and sure enough they were there. They were actually not in the best view in that area because they did decide to breed on this little island with these sticks and trees and stuff, these dead trees and everything. Um, they were in the middle so you could see through the trees but you couldn't really get good pictures of them or see them very well. But I did see them flying back and forth and I saw all the ibis everywhere and the egrets and everything like that. So I mean you can see them but eh. I got better pictures at um, Morazic Pond in the Everglades where it's all open and they were actually roosting all over the trees and you could see them perfectly. So, um, you know, according to the information on allaboutbirds.com, this says that, that they prefer islands or they prefer to nest over standing water, which is, you know, what I saw. It says that they put their nests um, in the shadiest part of the uh, trees in that area as, hi as high up as 16 feet. So that's, that's pretty interesting. Um, so when the males are in the breeding season, they'll do a behavior um, like bobbing their heads up and down while shaking twigs to the females to get their attention. So yeah, that's interesting. I bet, you know, she sees him over there and she's like, hey, that's a nice stick you've got over there. <laughs> you know, come over here and let's talk a little bit. So if she decides she likes him and his twigs are impressive, she will invite him over for a beak bite. Apparently, interested pairs will bite each other's beaks and raise their wings up as well. I bet that is an interesting sight to see. I have not observed this, but I bet you've got to have some pretty good coordination to do that dance. <laughs> so um, if they decide to become paired, the male with uh, will present her with a present, which is uh, more sticks. You know, that's kind of a thing here. <laughs> and they'll shake them together in their bills. How sweet. <laughs> so, and, but unfortunately, roseate spoonbills are not monogamous because they only stay together through one breeding season. So, uh, many birds are monogamous, but apparently these are not. So now that all of that is done, you know, the back and forth and hey, do you want to hang out? You know, do you want to be together? Okay, let's have a baby. Okay, so nesting. <laughs> let's talk a little bit about that. So the male is the one that collects the sticks. Big surprise. <laughs> he collects the sticks for the female and the female will build the nest the way that she likes it, just as us women like to do. They will build it like a bulky platform with plant materials like moss and bark strips. The nest can be about 22 inches wide to 4.5 inches deep. Hmm. Okay, that's pretty good I guess. Um, their clutch size for a brood is going to be about 1 to 5 eggs. They usually have one brood a year. They incubate for about 22 days. The nesting period is about 35 to 45 days, and the eggs are whitish in color to pale green with uniform brown spots all around. If you were to see a juvenile, the juveniles are lighter in color than their bright pink adults. So I hope you enjoyed this video and you learned a little bit more about the Rosiette Spoonbill. Comment below if you've ever seen a Spoonbill or if you'd like to see one and let me know where you're from or where you saw it if you did see it and I hope that you can like and subscribe um, so that you can see more videos about birds and learn more and get more information. If you're a birder like I am, I like to know and study as much as I can about birds. So um, everybody have a great day. Thanks for watching. <laughs>